We're blessed this morning to have such a tremendous preacher with us in Brother Chester Mitchell. He and his sweet wife and their staff is building a tremendous work in Washington, D.C. What a great man of God. And he preached here a couple of years ago and he preached with such a burden. that I felt like having him back to convey the thought again to this congregation of what the Lord is doing in the last days. Would you welcome my friend and a great man of God, Brother Chester Mitchell. Come on, let's give the Lord. Let's give the Lord the highest, the highest of our praise. Hallelujah. 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 Come on, stretch your hand up to heaven this morning. God, we give you the highest of our praise this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we stand in your presence on this morning. We know that divine destiny has brought us to this place. None of us are here by accident. God, you have so decreed it that this meeting should happen, that we should be here, that the word of the Lord would go forth with great anointing and with great power. For God, we come not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit of God and of power that our faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so for every preacher this morning, every preacher's wife, I'm asking you, God, to reach down and do a sovereign work. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I am convinced that Jesus Christ was so intentional as he always was when he spoke, when he decreed that of all men born among women, there was none greater than John the Baptist. He said of all the men born among women, he said there was indeed none greater than John the Baptist. And then he goes on to say that the least in the kingdom would be greater than John. Everyone say, the least. It would have been something that if he had said, the greatest in the kingdom would be better than John. But he said, the least in the kingdom would be greater than John. And so I asked the question, what was it about John the Baptist that caused Jesus to say that of all men born among women, there would be none greater than, there was none greater than John the Baptist? Just what was it about the ministry of John the Baptist that caused Jesus? Jesus to say that I submit to you this morning and consider with me that when they asked John the Baptist at the beginning of the book of John when they said who are you they said Mr. John who are you dressed in that fancy suit eating locusts and wild honey wild hairdo Wild Afro, who are you? John the Baptist looked at them straight in the eye and he said, let me tell you who I am. He said, I am not he. One more time, Mr. John, who are you? Who are you dressed in those wild clothes, wild hair, eating that wild diet? Just who are you? He said, listen to me. I am not he. I am not the real deal. I am not what it's all about. I am not the star of the show. I am not the one, amen, that people are to be looking to. One more time, Mr. John, who who are you? Didn't you hear me? I told you one time. I'm going to tell you again. I am not he. Come on, lift your hands and say that with me. I am not he. Oh, lift your hand one more time and say it with me. I am not he. 
What do you think would happen next Sunday if you walked into your church and somebody said, Pastor, I, I, I got this big old problem. And you looked at them and say, I am not here. Preacher, can you do this for me? I am not here. Pastor, can you give me an answer to my problem? I am not here. He said, there's one coming after me who is mightier than I, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He, 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 when he comes, he will baptize you. I'm telling you, amen, at this great conference, he is still the baptizer. And if he doesn't do it, it still does not happen. He, 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 I hear him saying, if I be lifted up. He said, when he comes, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then John went on to say what I believe is probably one of the greatest things that a man of God can say John went on to say this. Hear me this morning. It is the greatest thing that any one of us can say. He said, listen, I want everybody to hear me clearly. He said, I told you before, I'm not here. I was serious about it. He said, here's the deal. He must increase and I must 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 it is a biblical imperative I must decrease he said ladies and gentlemen let me tell you something about me if I am to be successful I must have an ever decreasing ministry if I am to be the man that God wants me to be I must have an ever decreasing ministry as the years go by there must be less of Chester Mitchell and more of God there must be less of me and more of him there must be less of you and more of him you don't believe that this morning you don't really believe that do you that's not popular in our world that's not popular in a lot of places but John said it I want you to understand how I'm thinking there's going to come a day when I'm going to move out of the spotlight and everybody's going to know that John was not really the big deal it wasn't about me it wasn't about my words he must increase and I must decrease want to have a revival get out of the way Come on. Want to have a move of God? Just get out of the way. Want God to speak? Get out of the way. Get out of the way. Come on, lift your hands. Say, he must increase. Oh. You know, I, I, I sense a little resistance in the Holy Ghost when, when you start talking that way. Because there's something about Chester Mitchell. He does not naturally want to decrease. Be seated. It is not natural for us to want to decrease. But I'm speaking to you today. And I'm telling you that God calls us to an ever decreasing ministry. For the church is called to be faithful to the gospel, but, but it must be alert to the fact that it reads and it interprets the scriptures through its cultural lenses. It is a church with a long heritage that can e either enrich us or encapsulate us. As the church faces new challenges, everybody say new challenges. Come on, new challenges. New challenges. Come on, new challenges. New challenges. 
as the church faces new challenges. It needs to have learned well the lessons from past periods when it faced equally momentous, although different challenges. At the same time, this missional church must recognize its responsibility before God to witness faithfully by demonstrating both the relevance and the power of the gospel within this contemporary setting. There will always be a divine tension between the church as it existed back then and as it is existing now. There, there is a tension in the atmosphere. There is a tension in the church and there will always be a, a divine tension in the church. Why? Because it's a fragmented world that we're living in. It's a global world. It's a world now where Hindus and Muslims, someone said, no longer live side by side, but Hindus and Muslims sometimes reside within the same person. Because people are so mixed up about what they believe. A little bit of this and a little bit of that. There's ambiguity, there's, there's diversity, there's paradox, amen, there, there's mess all around. But let me tell you something, there's always going to be a mess, amen, there's just always going to be a mess. In fact, amen, you can't have a God-ordained mission without a mess. You can't have a revival without a mess. You can't have anything going on without there being some kind of a situation. I submit to you that where there's no mess, there's, there are no miracles. One more time, uh, where there's no mess, there really are no miracles. Uh, only when I have a situation, everybody say a situation. Only when I have a situation do I qualify for supernatural power. You don't get supernatural power if you don't have a situation, amen, that demands and requires supernatural power. So often if we're not careful, we are concerned about the wrong things. We place the focus on the wrong things. Y you know, I, I love the church, but I, sometimes I, I get weary because I, I, I see people just jostling for positions and maneuvering themselves. Poking them and say, quit maneuvering. When are we going to stop playing that political game? Come on now. When are we going to stop playing that political game? When are we going to stop acting like we're one thing when we're with one crowd? Amen. And then we become another thing when we're another crowd. And another thing when we become an with another crowd. And then another thing. Amen. That's a prescription. Amen. For psychosis. Come on. I am not here. I am not here. But there comes one after me. And he is mightier than I. And the latchet of whose shoes I'm not worthy to unloose. And he... Shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Andrew Grove, who is the CEO of Intel Corporation, I read after him recently. He said, You know, he said, whenever there is a problem at Intel, he said, whenever there's a need for new direction, he said, I find it necessary to step outside of the corporate culture with its institutional constraints and its tunnel vision. He said, Insiders, I'm about to say insiders. Insiders sometimes are the biggest problem. Insiders sometimes are the biggest problems. We struggle to get in and get in and get in and get in and get in. And then after we get in, we don't want anybody else to get in. On the same door that got us in, we start putting bars on that door and not want to let anybody else in. And we start saying things just to keep us in and keep everybody else out. You know what we need around here? We need some old outsiders coming on in and messing up on the inside. We do not need... 
to be a bunch of insiders uh, protecting the inside. There's a danger of being an insider. After a while, you just start talking the old company line and you don't even believe it anymore. But I still want to believe uh, Acts 2.38. Uh, I still want to believe uh, all of that stuff uh, with all of my heart. Uh, Be seated. Acts chapter 6 is a monumental paradigm shift in the church. For the Bible tells us in those days when the number, if I say number, the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Greeks. Can, can you believe that Dr. Luke had the audacity to tell us about a church problem? He said there was a murmuring. There was an apostolic murmuring. He said in the middle of the fire of the first century church, he said there was a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Everybody say there was a divine neglect. Somebody got neglected. Then the twelve called the multitudes of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason, it is not right that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you. Everybody say, among you. Everybody say, among you. Oh man, I wish uh, I had time uh, to go there. He said, look out among you. Look out among you seven men uh, of honest report, uh, full of the Holy Ghost uh, and wisdom. Look out among you. Brother Pew, look out among you. Look out among you. He said, there are people among us, uh, amen, that are of honest report, uh, that are full of the Holy Ghost uh, and wisdom. Everybody say, and wisdom. I'm 45 years old. I apologize to be able to stand here before you today and tell you I've known some wonderful people full of the Holy Ghost, but they had no wisdom. They had no wisdom. Their spiritual gift was called Goofy. That we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And listen to what Dr. Luke said. And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly and a great number of priests were obedient unto the faith and Stephen everybody say and Stephen and Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people I'm speaking to you today and I'm telling you my subject is simply this we need a revival of apostolic thinking in the 21st century we need a revival of apostolic thinking in the 21st century. In the apostolic church, amen, there was never an issue of who was bigger than who, amen, and who had this and who didn't have this. In the apostolic church, it was understood God could work on a Stephen. God could work here and God could work here. Come on, let's broaden our thinking. Let's broaden our thinking. My challenge to this great audience. Let's broaden our thinking here. Here we are because of the times. Can I be brutally honest with you? Sister Mitchell, stand up here. This is the lovely Sister Mitchell.
Brother Mangan, we are still married after all these years. You may be sweet. Amen. We've never talked about getting a divorce. Amen. We, we have talked about murder a couple of times, but we've never really talked about getting a divorce. Amen. We've been together and God's put his hand on us. But let me be brutally honest because I'm still, amen, very much a missionary, a whole missionary at heart. Seven and a half years ago, we got to the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Amen. We landed there. And I'm telling you what, amen, I was in for a rude awakening. It didn't take me long to realize Chester Mitchell couldn't grow weeds. He couldn't grow squat. He couldn't get anything done. He was a pitiful preacher. Thank God for my wife that stood next to me. Preachers, I'm telling you, you got to hang on to your wife in this 21st century. You got to hang on to your partner in this 21st century. She'll help you build a church. She'll help you build that church. She'll help you build that church. Listen to me. She'll help you build that church. We landed there and I realized that if God was going to do anything, I was going to have to think differently. I was going to have to think about say think. Come on, everybody, say think. Put your hand right here and say think. Oh, think, 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 think. I don't care what the problem is. But Bishop Kenny, if we can get enough thinkers in the room and get an apostolic anointing on them, we'll walk out with an apostolic solution. We need apostolic thinkers for the 21st century. We need people that will say, you know what? We're apostolic. Everybody say, we're apostolic. We're apostolics. Well, let's put our apostolic brains together and say, God, give us apostolic solutions for this day and for this hour. I'm preaching about apostolic thinking. About the apostolic thinking. Jesus set the stage for it. He said, you cannot put new wine in old wine skins. Don't even try it. He said, as he set the stage for what was to come, he said, give and it shall be given unto you. He said, open yourself up and turn yourself loose and literally give yourself away. Quit protecting yourself. Amen. Quit holding everything in. Open yourself up and give yourself away and it will come back to you. He said, lose your life and you will find it. He said, ladies and gentlemen, we must lose ourselves we must forget about who we are we must forget about our hairdos and our clothes and our bank accounts and our CDs he said we must literally lose our lives I went to visit a wonderful preacher of another denomination in my area a year or so ago he had resigned his church and he was leaving. He had been a wonderful friend to me. He had done a marvelous work in that area and I wanted to talk to him. He had befriended me and stood by me and prayed for me every step of the journey. And I, when I heard he was leaving, I went to see him. I sat in his office like I had several times before. And I said, my friend Jay, I said, you're getting ready to leave. I said, tell me this, if you had to do it all over again, if you had to do it all over again, tell me, what would you do differently? And I had my notepad, Bishop Tenney, and I was ready to write down, amen, some profound thought that he had. Uh, and he sat there, and he, and he fell on his knees, uh, and he started crying, uh, and big old tears coursed down his cheeks. Uh, and I just stood there and, and looked at him, amen. Uh, I thought I'd offended him or said something out of place. Uh, uh, and, and I asked, uh, I, I said, Jay, all I want to know is if you had to do it all over again, again what would you do differently and he and he sobbed and wept for about five minutes and then he said Chester listen to me he said if I had to do it all over again he said I would have gotten out of God's way he said there would have been less of me and more of him he said there would have been less of me and more of him he said I worked I did this I did that he said I almost lost my health lost my family lost everything he said in retrospect 
I needed more of Him and less of me. You see, that's a difficult message for we who are preachers. I desert in the Holy Ghost. But in this audience this morning, they're preachers. You've come to this great conference and you're literally worn out. You are burned out. You don't know if you really made the right choice when you hung in there. But the man preached last night with such eloquence and with such passion. And I thought, God, help us not to be so weary and so tired and so burned over that we hear one more passion message and we can't, can't hardly receive it because we're thinking, I don't know if I can climb that hill again. Again, I'm being painfully honest. Seven and a half years uh, into my work, uh, I can tell you about Sister Mitchell and me. Amen. We are desperately weary and worn out with the work that we are doing. Amen. It has taken everything that I've had. It's cost me more than I thought. Uh, amen. It would cost. Uh, and here I am. And God's blessed the church uh, that I pastor. And it's doing very well. Amen. This several Sundays ago, amen, we started our second service. Uh, amen. It's doing well by all counts. Uh, people are coming. Uh, amen. It's grown. God's blessed it. But you know, I'm looking at it uh, and I'm thinking, God, uh, I don't know if I've got what it takes uh, to take it to the next level. I'm not sure, God, that I have what it takes uh, to go another year, another month. Uh, I'm not sure, God, that me and Sister Mitchell have what we know that we had uh, what it took uh, to go dig it out. Uh, but here it is, 2004. And God, I don't know if I've got what it takes uh, to take it to the next hundred uh, and the next hundred and then the first thousand and the next thousand but I hear a word from God uh, you've got to decrease uh, and I have got to increase uh. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen uh, it is not God's will for the United Pentecostal Church uh, to raise up a bunch of burned out preachers uh, and burned out preachers wife uh, and discouraged preachers uh, and discouraged uh, preachers wife uh, God give us a new baptism uh, of apostolic thinking uh, give us a new baptism of apostolic Apostolic thinking. Come on. God, give me a new baptism of apostolic thinking. What I need right about now is not another program. What I need right about now is not another sermon. I need God to baptize my mind. I need Him to baptize my mind. Come on, preacher, lift your hand. He'll give you a new baptism in your mind. He'll give you a new baptism in your heart. We've got to have it because of the times. Because if we don't, listen to me, if we don't, we will look around and we will say, well, that's Anthony Mangan and that's T.W. Barnes, that's Jesse Williams, that's the eloquent Mike Williams. I can't come up to that. And there's a whole lot of us looking around at, at somebody else saying, I won't ever be able to be that. But I'm telling you, that's not what you need. Come on. Come on. The United Pentecostal Church has one Anthony Mangan. It don't need another. If it did, God would give us another. But what it needs is a baptized you. It's a baptized you with a mind of Christ. It needs a you with a baptized heart. Listen to me this morning. The devil may not have liked it, but Chester Mitchell was the man to go to Northern Virginia and raise up that church. He wasn't much, but God ordained it to be so and the gates of hell cannot prevail against a man that has a mind that is thinking in apostolic ways and apostolic concepts.
You're looking at the last guy that was supposed to plant anything. I don't even like flowers. They're work. You're looking at a guy that can't grow weeds. You're looking at somebody that never envisioned that God could ever do anything of great substance through him. But I was thinking wrong. I was thinking wrong. God had to change my thinking. God had to literally take me apart, bring me down, take me apart, bring me down, dismantle my thinking, dismantle my thinking, dismantle my thinking. Come on, Holy Ghost, dismantle my thinking. If you're a preacher here today and you're wore out, what you need is not another suit. You need a dismantling, amen, of your thinking and allowing God to put it back together. If you're a preacher's wife and you're contemplating walking away from the ministry, I'm telling you, before you leave this conference, find a place and say, God, dismantle me again. Listen, preacher, we can get to a place where we don't even like the people we pastor. We don't even like them. Dismantle my thinking. Come on, lift your hands. Say, dismantle my thinking, God. Help me to thank God. Help me to thank God the way that you want me to think. Send me back to my city, God, with a different thought. God, give me an apostolic thought. Help me, God, not to be restricted uh, by what the fella down the road is doing. Uh, help me not to be intimidated uh, by anybody else. Uh, help me to quit looking over uh, at the fence uh, at somebody else's ministry. And, oh, God, uh, give me an apostolic design uh, for the place that I pastor. God, give me an apostolic solution uh, for the place where I pastor. God, open apostolic doors uh, for me. Uh, God, help me to walk back into my city uh, and expect it to happen. Uh, because, God, uh, you've affected my thinking. Uh, You're looking at a fellow that believes that the greatest churches are still out there waiting to be built. I'm looking around at this one, and it's a great church. Thank God for it. But if you're here today and you're a young man, you're looking at a young man. Amen. I believe that the greatest United Pentecostal churches are still yet waiting to be built. They're still out there. But the man, they're still in the belly of some young man sitting here because of the times. The greatest United Pentecostal church is still sitting on the pew out there. And because of the time, get up, sir. Get up, sir. Get up, sir. Get up, sir. Change your thinking. He must increase and I must decrease. He must increase and I must decrease. Mr. Paney, next week I will be with you. We will dedicate the sanctuary in Stockton. That's a great church. But the greatest United Pentecostal churches are still waiting to be built. They're still waiting for someone to have an apostolic thought. You, you, you know what? I don't have a lot of time. But when are we going to ever quit putting the pressure on each other? When are we ever going to take the pressure off of each other and say, buddy, you, you want to go try that? Uh, you you, you want to try that? Uh, you go try that. Uh, and we're going to pray for you and cover you. You go and try that. Uh, because uh, if God ever gives you an apostolic thought, uh, the devil will not be able to stop it. Uh, the devil will not be able to stop it. Uh, you may not be much, uh, but the devil will not be able to stop uh, an apostolic thought. Uh, oh my God, Pastor. Pastor, there are apostolic thoughts in this building that are waiting to be germinated. <laughs> Lift your hands and say, no pressure. Oh, come on. No pressure. No pressure. No pressure. Yeah, no pressure. No pressure. No pressure. 
when I walked into this man's office eight years ago and said, Brother Haney, I feel like God is sending me, amen, to Washington, D.C. to raise up a church. He just smiled at me, leaned forward. He said, Chester, you ought to go try it. He said, go try it. He said, go after it, man. I was in shock. I thought he'd say, no, 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 don't leave. We got to release people in the 21st century. We got to come. Come on, preacher. You want to have a revival? Release something. Release something. Let something go. Let something go. Here's what I'm telling you. Most of us are much too much in a control. We're trying to control everything. We are to cover, not control. We are to give apostolic covering, not control. We are to release, not restrain. When I told him I was ready to go and that God had called me, he released me. He prayed over me. That church got behind me. Many of you got behind me. I went with an apostolic covering. The precious sister Thetis Tenney walked into the room just before I left. She said, Brother Mitchell, before you go, I want you to know every day there will be people that will cover you through the world network of prayer. And they prayed daily, 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 daily until the church was conceived. I'm talking about apostolic thinking. I went out there. Let me just tell you this. God began raising up people. God began sending people. God began helping Sister Mitchell and me to reach people. We would go places and, and, and we would literally run into people. But when you are under an apostolic covering, God will do things for you. Listen, preacher, I'm telling you, if you're not on an apostolic covering, get under one. Get under one. If... Get under an apostolic covering. This is no day for anybody to be thinking, I need to be out there by myself. Get under an apostolic covering. Get under an apostolic anointing. We got under apostolic covering. I, I've never gotten out from underneath it in my life. There are people that cover me. You, you say, Brother Mitchell, what's apostolic thinking? Apostolic thinking in the 21st century is that nobody needs to be out there by themselves. No one needs to be out there by themselves. Everyone needs a, a spiritual hand laid upon them. Somebody need everybody needs somebody that they answer to. Everyone needs a, a prophet in their lives. We were struggling at a particular point. And I remember getting up one morning and telling Sister Mitchell, I don't know that I've got what I need to take this church any further. This is probably about three years ago. And I, I remember she said to me, she said, you, you need to call uh, Pastor Haney and talk to him. And, and you, you know, sometimes your wife tells you something and you don't listen. I said, no, I don't want to bother him. She said, you better call him. I said, I don't want to bother him. I won't be able to reach him. She said, you, you, you better call him. And so I got on the phone real grudgingly and I dialed the number. And, and the secretary answered. And I said, I need to speak to Pastor Haney. And she said, I'll put you right through. I said, Brother Haney, I, I need something in this church, uh, and I don't have it. Who do I need? Everybody needs uh, somebody to help them. Uh, listen, preacher, if you're struggling by yourself, uh, go find somebody and say, help me. Help me. Don't die there by yourself. Uh, help me. Help me. Help me. Everybody needs somebody to help them. We were worshiping in an elementary school in a cafeteria. Some days I'd get there and I'd have to pull out the mop, amen, and the bucket, amen, and mop that floor because it was filthy. There were days there was garbage on the floor and we had to pick it up. Don't look at me that way. I said, Brother Haney, what do I need to do? He said, call Morton Bustard. He'll help you. I 
prophet. A prophet. He's going to spook my people. <laughs> Who needs a prophet when you're having problems? Listen to me, apostolic preachers. Uh, there must be a prophetic voice uh, that speaks into our lives, uh, that gives us direction. Uh, if you don't have a prophet in your life, uh, you're going to run into trouble somewhere down the road. Uh, a prophet will keep you on track. Uh, I called him up. Uh, I said, Brother Bustard, can you come, come in and preach for me? He said, Chad, I'll be there. He got on the plane and came, walked in on that Sunday morning. There was a house full of visitors, amen, all duded up, amen, nothing apostolic looking about them. He walks to that pulpit and he begins to speak the word of the Lord. And I watch every one of them get a big old smile on their face. And I watch people come to that altar that morning. I got the baptism of the Holy Ghost. One lady got healed, amen, on that Sunday morning. Thank God I had enough sense to understand it's not about me it's not about me it's not about me it's not about me it's about him come on there's something waiting to be released in your ministry but you've got to get out of the way there's something waiting to be released in your ministry but you must get out of the way come on everybody stand with me We cannot operate in the dimension of fear. We cannot operate in the dimension. Well, if it's going to be me done, it's going to be me. The widows are murmuring. Well, we need some apostolic thinking around here. There's a problem. Well, let's, let's put our apostolic heads together and find some new solutions. I'm telling you, Bishop Haney, the future of the apostolic movement will be secured if we think with apostolic minds. If we think God can do anything. If we think, you know what? You put the right man in the right place at the right time with the right set of resources. It will happen. If that man will understand that great churches are not built around any one person, but they are built around an apostolic concept and preachers, amen, that want all the glory for themselves are never going to build anything, amen. In fact, they will destroy what they have built, amen, because their last act will be to make themselves look good. But apostolic men and women will say at some particular point, amen, I must decrease, I must get out of the way and release something greater than myself I'm telling you amen there's something waiting to be birthed in your church but you've got to get an apostolic mindset it's not God's will for you and your wife to get a divorce it's not God's will for your ministry to be burned out it's God's will to give you a baptism a new baptism of apostolic thought remain standing Apostolic thinking caused me to go from managing problems to casting vision. It allowed me to get away from controlling followers to empowering leaders. Let me ask you, who are you empowering? Who are you empowering? Who are you empowering? Who are you, empowering? Who are you mentoring? Well, I don't know if I can make it. The tithes are barely coming in. Who are you empowering? Who are you releasing? Apostolic thinking takes me from creating 
or protecting calm to creating chaos. My job is not to calm things down. It's to stir things up. Stir things up. The, the stir it up, just stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, stir it up. Wherever things are settled down, it's my job to walk in there and say, let, let, let's put this thing on its head uh, and shake it a little bit, uh, amen, and stir it up. Uh, why don't you go back to your church uh, and change a few things? Um, and stir a few things up. Uh, I'll tell you what will happen. Yes, the devil will get stirred up, uh, but God uh, will give you an apostolic thought. Uh, Apostolic thinking took me away from myself and caused me to understand that forever I must lead the people that I pastor. I, 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 I just can't tell them about that soul winning thing. It's got to be me. I'm closing. Sister Mitchell and I began this year doing some work at our house and we hired a fellow to come paint he's from the great country of Romania his name is Alex I walked down there one day and Alex had just started painting and I said Alex tell me about yourself and he laid the paintbrush down he said my name is Alex I'm from Romania I said Alex are you married he said and his eyes kind of dropped. He said, no. He said, I've got a girlfriend. Her name's Michelle. She's from Germany. Michelle. He said, well, we've got a little baby. He said, we're new to America. I looked at him. I said, Alex, get back to painting. No, that's not what I said. I said, Alex, have you had a baby dedicated? He said, you know, he said, I'm, I'm new to America, broken English, heavy accent. He said, I, I, I don't know not, not much about churches. He said, do I need to pay? I said, no, Alex, we'll, we'll, we'll dedicate the baby. I, I said, you and Michelle need to get married. He said, but we don't want to have a church. I said, we'll, we'll, we'll marry you. We'll take you through the counseling. We'll, we'll, we'll marry you. But the man, and you should have seen him. Before he got there, I told, I told the first service, I said, Alex... Brosom is coming to church today with Michelle. He comes walking in the door. Man, everybody was all over him. Hey, Alex. Hey, Alex. Hey, Alex. Hey, Alex. His eyes got all real big. Hey, Alex. They seated him in a special spot. I called him forward with him and Michelle to dedicate that little old baby. I said, ladies and gentlemen, Alex and Michelle are dedicating their baby today. The whole church erupted in, in, in just a roar. Oh, Alex, he about fell out. I can tell you that little old Romanian Alex and that little German Michelle has brought me more joy this year than anything I've done, any sermon I've preached. Come on, you want to have a revival church? There's an Alex out there. Why don't you go find him? Why don't you go find him? That's an apostolic thought. That's an apostolic thought. That's an apostolic thought. God, I'm not going to get bogged down with problems and problems. I'm going to bust down and find somebody to love. Come on, lift your hands. Come on. God, I'm going to find somebody to minister to. I'm going to find somebody that I can pour myself into. I'm going to find somebody, God, that needs who I am. Come on, lift your hands. Come on, preacher. You don't have to be burned out or burned over. God can give you an apostolic thought today that will put new anointing in your ministry. Come on, preacher. You don't have to walk away from your ministry. God can give you an apostolic thought today that will make the difference. Come on, sir. It's not about you anyway. It's all about him. 
Maybe your church is plateaued, but get ready for an apostolic thought. Get ready for an apostolic thought. Get ready for an apostolic thought. Come on, lift your hands and say, God, give me an apostolic thought. Give me an apostolic thought. Come on. Into this place right now. There is coming apostolic thinking. There are young men in this place. God's giving you an apostolic idea. Don't let anybody take it away from you. Pray over it. Protect it. Get it under spiritual authority. But go, go, go. Because this thing is all about apostolic ideas. Come on, hold that hand up. I speak to that man. You've had fear about whether or not you should go any further. I speak an apostolic thought into your mind. You are about ready to break into a new dimension of spiritual authority and dominion. I speak to someone today, when you get back to that city, there will be doors open for you. Doors that you never could open by yourself. Doors that you never thought weren't even existed. Come on, sir. When you get back to that church, to that city, things will begin happening. Why? Because God's given you an apostolic idea. Come on, lift both hands and call out to God. Baptize my mind with apostolic thinking.